Last topic for the exam will be a company's decision to go private. So we talked about going public. <laughs> Let's go the reverse. So you can only go private if you've already been public, of course, because you're private when you start um, until you go public, right? But sometimes companies like to do the reverse and sometimes they go public again. So that's the age old question. Can you have more than one IPO? Well, I don't know if you go from private to public to private to public. I think that's technically two IPOs. For the exam, just put they can only have one IPO, <laughs> just to be clear. All right, so what does it mean to go private? Transaction in which the entire equity of a publicly held firm is purchased by a small group of investors ending the public trading of a stock. Now, this is typically done in what's called an LBO or a leveraged buyout. Um, basically, this is when they issue a lot of debt in order to do this. So the firm will borrow a lot of money and then they will use that money to go out and repurchase the publicly traded shares of the company, which then become private equity. All right, so it says a transaction in which a firm's publicly owned stock is acquired in a mostly debt finance tender offer, that's the leverage part, resulting in a privately owned, highly leveraged firm, often um, in edited, I don't know what the word means. <laughs> Often done by the firm's own management. <laughs> Ooh, that's when you just are typing a definition and not paying attention. Um, basically, it just means that like the managers are going to have a good bit of ownership now in the firm. Um, these are often done with the use of these private equity funds also. So what a private equity fund will do is it says it raises money from institutional investors and a relatively small number of people with money primarily invest in stock of private companies. And so again, more sophisticated, um, kind of think of them like not so much like a venture capitalist because venture capitalists like to help firms get started kind of thing, right? Whereas this is like um, the mature version of venture capitalists right to where you have these sophisticated investors who are often going to have an expertise in the industry that they are helping you know to manage the firm or that firm um and it's going to be a much smaller group of equity holders you know you'll no longer have just all these regular people holding the public stock of the firm instead you're going to concentrate it on a very small group of very wealthy sophisticated educated investors um, really, it's just a change on the balance sheet, honestly. So this whole impact on the balance sheet thing, it's like you're not actually changing the operations of a firm, right? All you're doing is you're changing like who do you owe money to and who owns the firm. But what we see is that often these private equity firms are actually willing to pay a premium to take a firm private. So here's an example from your book. Um, 2006, HCA was a large healthcare corporation, was taken private by the original family owners and a group of private equity firms and investment banks. All right, they did that at $51 per share, but the stock had only been selling in the low 40s in the month prior to the announcement. They're willing to overpay. <laughs> the investors put up about 4.9 billion in equity and borrowed about 28 billion. So then there's that leverage part. That's a lot of debt. To fund the purchase of equity and refinance some of the company's debt. It says it is hard to believe that these sophisticated, in, in, sophisticated investors and managers would knowingly pay too much. What are they doing? Thus, the investors and managers must have regarded the firm as being grossly undervalued, even at $51 per share, or else thought that they could significantly boost the firm's value under private ownership. After four years as a private company, they went back public again. <laughs> Can't make up their mind. The owners received $4.3 billion in dividends during 2010 and an additional $1.1 billion in cash from shares they sold in the IPO, 
almost completely recovering their initial investment. After the IPO, the stock was worth about $16 billion, with about 25% of the company in public hands, and 75% or about $12 billion remaining with the private equity fund. Although the total return the investors ultimately earn depends on how much they receive for the shares, they still hold in the company $4.9 billion investment that reaped cash and stock worth $16 billion over four years. Not bad. Right? So they're not doing this like because they just want to be private. They're doing this because they think the firm's undervalued or that they can increase the value by being private. So here are some basic advantages of going private. Administrative cost savings, you don't have to deal with the SEC so much. Yes, you still have to deal with the SEC somewhat. You know, you have to prove your investors are the right type of investors and all that stuff. But it's not the same level of scrutiny and paperwork and reporting that you have to do. You also don't have to respond to those pesky stockholders anymore. You tell them to go away. <laughs> um, increased managerial incentives. So often you have your managers being significant owners in these types of arrangements. And so we know anytime your managers are actually your owners and your owners are your managers, your managers are going to um, behave better. Um, so managerial efficiency tends to increase because they have a, a bigger stake now. If the firm does great, they can see their wealth explode. If the firm fails, well, they fail too. <laughs> Works. Um, increased managerial flexibility. So we know that firms, if they are publicly traded and they miss like an earnings target, right, they get hammered. You know who comes up with those earnings targets? It's not the firm. Analysts do. Outsiders of the firm come up with earnings targets. And then if a firm misses it, you know, everyone like loses their mind. But the firm never said that in the first place. Um, you don't have any of that. And so the managers can focus on long-term goals and not short-term earnings. Or they can do things that are not going to be publicly approved of. That's my whole example earlier. Of like, if I got to cut my leg off, I don't want an audience. If I have to do the equivalent for a firm, I don't want an audience. And so if I'm private and I'm dealing with sophisticated investors who understand strategic, you know, actions, then I have a lot more flexibility as a manager. Um, I'm going to have increased shareholder oversight and participation. So I'm replacing like a group of just the general public as my shareholders with a much smaller group of sophisticated, educated investors. You know, it's, it's like Walmart people versus, I don't know, Target people or something. Oh, that sounds terrible. Um, it, it's, it's oversight in a good way, right? Because I have now sophisticated investors. And they're going to have an incentive to be involved with the firm and monitor the firm and make sure the firm is being run well. Right. And so much higher level of sophistication here. And finally, I get my increased financial leverage. That is that heavy, heavy debt usage. Right. Because a lot of these are done with those LBOs. That is going to give me a tax shield. And it's also or it's going to give me a larger tax shield. And it's going to give me that leverage effect. Anytime I have leverage, I get higher returns. I also get higher risk, right? Because I have to make those debt payments no matter what. But that should make my managers become more efficient because they know I can't have any kind of nonsense going on because I have to make these debt payments no matter what, right? So it forces the firm to kind of trim itself and make sure it's operating as efficient as possible. So that is our five advantages of going private. Um, why aren't all firms private? Well, because there's benefits to being public. I mean, you know, there's no one answer for firms and we see firms go back and forth. And so obviously they think there's benefits to both being private and public and it's whatever just works better for the firm at the time.
you know, whatever goals they're trying to achieve at this time. And like I said, especially, I think it was Chrysler uh, when the car industry was having trouble in the late 2010s. I don't know how you say that, late 2000s, 2010. Um, I think they were taken private because they wanted to restructure them and they didn't want the scrutiny of the market. And then, well, yeah, we'll go back public after. We just don't want like the market yelling and you know scrutinizing our every decision that we make if we're gonna have to chop off all the legs of the company and put it back together. So we see firms do both. So that is what you need to know for your exam. Again, expect chapter 11 to be mostly the math part. Um, there'll be some conceptual questions, of course, and chapter 18 to be all conceptual.